right, let's get this show on the road. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Today is January 12, 2023. My name is John Bramble. I am the Executive Director for the Network of the National Library of Medicine in Region 4. I'm housed here at the University of Utah, and I'm here with uh, some uh, wonderful speakers. Uh, Dr. Lichman and Dr. Henderson will be talking about um, uh, information resources used, essentially information resource used by uh, people who are hard of hearing uh, or are deaf, uh, and we'll be getting into that here soon. Um, you also notice that we have a, a sign language interpreter here. Um, I think Dr. Lichman is gonna talk a little bit more about that later. And let me go ahead and jump into introductions. This information is also on the uh, webpage for uh, when you registered. So let me uh, get through their, uh, their small biographies. So we have here today, Dr. Lichman uh, is an associate professor at the University of Utah College of Nursing. She's also an adjunct uh, assistant professor of internal medicine and is a nurse practitioner at the Utah Diabetes and Endo Endocrinology Center. Uh, she serves as a medical director of the Intensive Diabetes Education and Support Program at the University of Utah, a multidisciplinary diabetes self-management education and support program that integrates shared medical visits. Um, she has a very fascinating uh, biography, so I encourage you to, to uh, check that out. Uh, fantastic work that she's doing. We also have Dr. Henderson who is a research associate at the University of Utah uh, Health and is originally from Aberdeen, Scotland. Uh, he's a clinical psychologist. Uh, he is a clinical psychologist by training. Uh, he capped off a fellowship in pediatric clinical and neurophysiology, uh, psychology, sorry, at Harvard Medical School and has taught, a, uh, has taught in a number of tier one institutions, including Boston University, Tufts University, Harvard Medical School and John Hopkins. So please uh, welcome our two speakers. Thank you, Cody, for uh, being our interpreter and take it away. Great, thanks so much. Um, so I'm gonna just kick us off and kind of explain um, where we're at um, with this presentation and then I'm gonna turn it over to Murdoch. What we were asked to do, um, because all of you are library science professionals, what we were asked to do is provide some information about the deaf community. I personally um, have six deaf family members, including my mom, and I um, had an experience where my aunt did not have an interpreter while she was being hospitalized, and she was explaining that she couldn't breathe to the clinician, to the nurse. And the nurse didn't understand, brought blankets, brought, brought water, and um, that information didn't get relayed, and she died a week later. And so this is really important to me. Um, Murdoch can tell you his story in just a moment, but we're both passionate about making things better for the deaf community. And we, when we talk through our presentation, I just want you to kind of be open to the concept that um, deaf populations are not receiving equal access to health care. And um, for that reason, we're excited to be here so that we can help share that with you and to talk about potential ways that medical science librarians can, um, can support resources, both for individuals at the patient level, so deaf people live, um, living with some sort of health condition, and then also the clinicians that take care of them. So Murdoch, Dr. Henderson, he's going to be talking about the deaf perspective, and then I'm going to be taking the nurse practitioner or the clinician perspective. So I'll turn the time over to Murdoch. First of all, thank you everybody for being here at this session here with us to talk about these, these topics. It's very near and dear to my heart. As Michelle said, I'm deaf. I was born deaf and uh, obviously raised deaf. My role is to help get it into your hearts and minds some information. What I mean by that <clears throat> is how we filter information in a meaningful way in integrating it to our knowledge base is important. It's an important way for us to help those that uh, are traversing the trail. We, we know about the poem uh, that is uh, the road less traveled and uh, 
deaf folks generally walk a road less traveled. And so my goal here today is to share some information about that road less traveled. Uh, most folks who are not deaf, who are hearing, as we might call them, uh, acquire language in a incidental, accidental way. They hear things at the grocery store. They hear things uh, here, there, and everywhere. Those who are born or shortly after they're born become deaf. Uh, that road for language acquisition is, again, much less traveled and much more uh, complex and inherently at a disadvantage for the remainder of that individual's life. Many families, uh, typically the statistics show us about 90% of deaf folks are born to families or become deaf in families with parents that do not know sign language or family members who are not familiar with sign language. And, and obviously, therefore, they would not know what to do with a child or an infant who does not hear. And a lot of folks have a hard time realizing what the impact of that is um, and, uh, and our understanding of the world for the deaf individual. There's a strong association between language and how we handle and react to the stresses of daily life. There are, uh, as you all know, a variety of stresses that uh, are brought to people in, in daily life that uh, when encountered can result in success or in failure. And what I mean by success is I mean uh, raising of a family, uh, living a fulfilling life, uh, carrying a torch of, of life and humanity forward. And those challenges are inherently uh, difficult for a deaf individual because of language. Those who have what's called language deprivation um, are sometimes what we call dinner table syndrome. And you may or may not have heard of this in the media. It's becoming more and more popular. And if not, that's fine. That's why I'm here. This is really meaningful for those who are deaf or who can't hear. Uh, envision a daily ritual that the American family participates in is getting around the dinner table and talking. We, we go back and forth. Language is being facilitated. Children are learning words. You're hearing and developing new vocabulary. Uh, your understanding or schema of the world is becoming stronger and more well-rounded. And at that same table, you have a deaf individual like myself eating my food and not hearing anything, right? I, it's going in one ear and going out the other, essentially, right? Every once in a while, uh, I, I uh, would reach out to my family and say, hey, what are we talking about? And I'd get a Cliff Notes version, if anything, an abbreviated version of what is being talked about. And that uh, chronic experience, day in, day out, year over year, leads to some severe clinical consequences, uh, depression, heart disease, uh, and diabetes, which is what Michelle and I focus on. There are strong correlations and associations between the stress responses and those types of conditions, medical conditions. And so that leads us to um, more severe issues. Therefore, folks, uh, deaf folks are considered one of the most expensive groups to treat within the medical uh, setting because of this uh, language deprivation and the lack of understanding on how they think about their health, how they critically perceive the world and their whole self. So Michelle and I are, uh, Dr. Lichman, excuse me, Dr. Lichman and I are coming at this of how can language, why is language so important? And uh, we've designed a program called the DDCT, meaning Deaf Diabetics Can Together. And uh, I'm going to now pass uh, the time to Dr. Lichman, who will uh, share some of her perspective from the medical side of things. So thanks for giving me a minute. Great. I'm just going to wait for the spotlight. Great. Thanks. Um, well, thanks, Dr. Henderson, for kind of kicking us off and helping people understand um, more of the deaf perspective. 
Now I'm going to talk about the clinician perspective. So if I'm seeing a patient in the clinical setting and one thing that I don't necessarily have control of is whether or not the interpreter gets set up. And so I want to just take you through what a scenario of what typically happens. A, a deaf person will contact the clinic, usually through some sort of interpreter service. So they have these, um, these video-based telephone systems in their home. So there's a, a camera hooked onto their TV. They can visually talk to an interpreter in sign language and the interpreter then calls the clinic or another place, and then it goes through this system. A lot of times, clinics don't who aren't trained, those receptionists, they're not trained to work with an interpreter system. They don't know what's going on and can hang up. And so many, many times, deaf people get hung up on. The second thing that happens in a clinical setting is when a deaf person might request an interpreter, um, sometimes the front staff will say, we'll try. Um, sometimes they'll bluntly say, we can't do that, um, mostly because they don't know how or because they're worried about the cost of that. What, what that ends up being is that only 50% of the time when a deaf person goes to a clinic, do they actually have an interpreter? So if you just sat back and thought about the last time you went to a clinic appointment and not being able to communicate in your language, that would be really challenging because a lot of times we're going to the clinic because we have a health condition we're scared about or we need advice on or we might need a new medication. And if you can't effectively communicate, that's, that's very, very challenging. And then I'll add, you know, 50% of the time they have an interpreter. And then one third of the time of the people who show up, are they actually medically trained? So medical training, we all know that there's medical jargon that we use. And so if I am trying to distinguish hypoglycemia versus hyperglycemia, does the interpreter actually catch that word and understand exactly what that means and then convey that information correctly to the deaf person? So that's really, really critical that we have someone who's medically trained, just like we would want if we were in, a, um, in the courtroom, we would want someone who understood all the legal jargon. We would want someone legally trained. I think another issue that happens is um, clinicians often think, I have a deaf person in my office. I'll just write notes back and forth. That'll be easy. We don't need an interpreter. But one of the things that um, most clinicians don't realize, pretty much everyone that I talk to about um, this space, is most people assume sign language and English are the same. Because I know sign language, I can automatically write notes back and forth in English. But these are two separate languages. They're grammatically different. They have a different syntax. And just because you know sign language doesn't automatically mean that you know English. Because they're two separate languages, for someone to know both, they would need to be bilingual. So that would be like if I'm in the clinic and I want to give you some education on maybe you just had strep throat. And I'm going to write a note, you have strep throat, here's your antibiotic. And then usually there's a printout or some sort of education that's given to that patient. And these, you know, the, these are the symptoms that you would need to look at that would mean there's an emergency, you need to come back, here are some uh, little tips on your medication, make sure you fully complete the antibiotic, um, here are the side effects. If you just hand that written document to a patient that's deaf, you can't 100% guarantee that they're going to completely comprehend it. It's just like handing someone who speaks Spanish uh, a handout in French. It's a totally different language. And so I think a lot of us try to fall back on the fact that, oh, we'll just hand it to them in English. We've, we've covered our bases. But that's not, that's not true. And so as a clinician, I have some challenges where, number one, I need to make sure that an interpreter gets set up. And that's typically done by a front desk person. I need to make sure that that interpreter has some sort of medical knowledge that they're certified so that they can convey information correctly. And then if I have education resources, you know, a lot of times like with um, here at the University of Utah, we use Epic and we have education um, handouts right built right into our system. And we can just click a button that says provide this person with the strep throat handout, or we can say, you know, someone has a new diagnosis of diabetes, let's click and add that education handout. Um, and so it gets to them electronically or printed. 
Um, we don't have anything that magically puts a sign language video in front of our patients. And so that's one of the biggest challenges that I see happening is we have so much breakdown of communication and clinicians, I think, um, you know, they want to do best for their patients, but they don't always necessarily understand all of the complexities that go with making sure communication is conveyed clearly. We make a lot of assumptions when we're trying to think through that interpretation piece or that translation of language piece. So there's a couple of things that librarians can do to help. Um, the first is making sure that you're not only looking for resources in English, but looking for resources in sign language. There's not a lot, but there are some. Typically, um, those resources are on YouTube. They're not necessarily um, in like a, a specific space that's housed for all the videos. I do wanna caution that there are some challenges with that because if you can't personally watch that video and understand is all of this stuff correct, um, it might not be. So we did a systematic appraisal of YouTube videos, specifically to diabetes education videos that were in American Sign Language. And what we found is there were, number one, very few videos. Uh, number two, over 50% of them were not done by healthcare providers. They're actually assignments that people who are taking a sign language class loaded to YouTube so that their instructor could see it. And so did that interpreter student get an A on their assignment? Did they interpret that concept really well? Or did they get a D minus? So unless you can actually watch that video, that's gonna be really hard for you to really um, understand. So I do wanna caution that not all um, education videos in sign language are actually done by healthcare professionals, even if they have a health topic. And this is true for English as well. You know, if you were just to type in something related to a health condition, you've got a mix of uh, professional organizations, health, you know, healthcare providers, and then patients, and then just other people who are posting videos about education. Um, what Murdoch alluded to is we are developing something called the Deaf Diabetes Can Together program, where this is led by an all deaf community advisory board that is natu nationally situated. That's really important because sign language can have regional signs. So just like we might say y'all in Texas, but we say you all in here in Utah, there are these little accents that we have and, and sayings that we have. And that's true for sign language as well. And so we purposely have this national advisory board that's all across the country so that we can make sure that we're making the signs fit within the region and that it can be understood by all regions. So with that, um, pretty soon here, by the end of the summer, we're gonna have a bunch of diabetes education videos that can be a resource for um, individuals to be using. And our hope is to grow that from just diabetes to cardiovascular, to kidney, et cetera, because we're trying to build that library for these education videos. But until then, um, I think it's really important that we use interpreters to make sure that we're conveying information correctly. One thing that I also am, um, and we might get to this with the Q&A discussion, but most deaf people, um, they're getting information from a deaf center. So we have one here situated um, in the Salt Lake Valley, um, wherever, whatever state you might be from, you'll probably have a deaf center somewhere there as well. And it might work for you to work with that deaf center to see what resources they have, what resources they still need, and if there's a way to partner with them to make sure that the deaf people that are there are being served appropriately. And the deaf centers are great about making sure that interpreter services are available if there is like a hearing presenter that comes and talks to them. But that's another great way for a librarian to sort of reach out and work with the deaf community to make sure that they have the resources they need related to healthcare. So at this time, I wanna just open it up to questions to see if you guys, um, I'm interested if anybody's encountered either um, a deaf individual looking for health information or a clinician 
who is trying to find resources for a deaf patient or just any other general questions that you might have that Dr. Henderson and I can field. Thank you. Um, I see a question, whoever is spotlighting, can you put the three of us, me and um, the interpreter and Dr. Henderson together and then we can um, field questions. Great, so I see um, Jean McClelland has her right hand up. Hello, um, I'm Jean McClelland. I'm from the University of Arizona Health Sciences Library in Tucson, Arizona. Um, and we've done a lot of work with, uh, or I have in my previous prior to library in life, worked with refugee communities and access to health care. I also realize in uh, Salt Lake City, there's a large resettled population of various refugees. Some of this setting up interpreter work has always been necessary with these folks, but there is a, a large number also of um, deaf refugees and I know ASL is only one of many sign languages. Have you had, do you have advice or ideas of resources for accessing um, deaf-oriented uh, language other than ASL so in the I, United States? Yeah, great question. I'll, I'll answer that. And then if um, Murdoch wants to answer as well. So my mom is from Vietnam and was a refugee. And when she grew up in Vietnam, she used a Vietnamese home sign language. And then when she came to the United States, it was all different. And so the best way to communicate with someone who is from a different country that might have a different sign is to use what's called a certified deaf interpreter. We use the words, the, the acronym CDI. So what happens is you've got your hearing, let's say your hearing clinician, they are talking to the deaf patient through a hearing interpreter. And then the, there's a certified deaf interpreter. They're deaf, but they're watching that hearing interpreter. And then they're using a lot more gesturing and different types of signs to make sure that the, the deaf patient understands. And so it's two layers of interpreters, but they can, um, I would say that this is for people who maybe have a different, um, their, their sign is, is from a different country, or maybe their um, language level is a little bit different. Um, as Dr. Henderson alluded to earlier with language deprivation, if you feel like you're not getting through to someone with a hearing interpreter, you have to add a certified deaf interpreter and they work together in tandem. And typically you just, um, like, how would you find one? They're, they're at the same place that you would get a hearing interpreter. So you would say, I need a hearing interpreter and a certified deaf interpreter. And you would, we would at, request those at the same time. Murdoch, do you wanna add anything to that? Yeah, I think uh, Michelle really hit the nail on the head. I, I would like to add a couple more points if, uh, if I may, if time permitting. Uh, first, uh, interestingly, my, my own wife is from another country, and she's deaf, and for her to come to the U.S. Um, and relearn sign language is different. Her primary sign, uh, language is not English or Spanish, and those are the top two languages used here in the United States. With that in mind, I strongly encourage and recommend uh, the same thing we do in our programming here at DCT is really try to orient yourself on a visual basis, not necessarily through sign language exclusively, but uh, we've we've developed some manuals and, and pamphlets that they understand the process uh, visually. For instance, in a medical situation, you may uh, uh, require the use of a, a pump or a uh, implanted monitor on the on the back of your arm, um, understanding how all of those things work in tandem or perhaps in sequence. Um, th those kinds of things are important, right? So like, think about like uh, basic CPR programming. Usually there's some kind of diagramming in there, right? Where they have uh, pictures of do this, then put your mouth on the, on the person's mouth. For instance, in Britain, uh, their equivalents uh, for the Americans with Dis or Diabetes Association, they have an equivalent on their website of content using British Sign Language. And uh, 
that's obviously to serve the constituents of their country and those that use that language in understanding their diabetic care. Also, in Australia, they have similar things on their websites. And so that's really where Michelle and I are deriving inspiration of how do we here in the United States, apparently the leader of the free world uh, in, in understanding medical technology and everything, uh, I'm being facetious to a point, but uh, we want to really get out there and get in front of this and understanding how do we understand uh, as a deaf community our healthcare. So. Uh, I can see your hand up again. Do you have a follow-up question? Um, you know, you also did mention earlier um, the hang-ups or the 50% loss of people accessing, like, the frontline staff in a clinic. Um, do you have, have you developed sort of um, best practices for training staff on not doing that? I know we did that for also the similar issues with serving refugees in Tucson. So I think it's a two-pronged issue. Um, one is we have to train staff at the clinics. And the way that uh, Murdoch and I have approached this is we are actually training different students because we're part of a University of Utah system. We have access to nursing students, dental students, et cetera. So we're making sure that they all understand this process. Um, the other thing we're doing is we're building in an advocacy component in our diabetes education program. So a lot of times um, a diabetes education program, you know, what's this medication? How do you eat, exercise, all of those things? Um, we're purposely building in a week of self-advocacy so that they know um, their rights. So there are legal rights to having an interpreter to make sure that um, that you can you have access to information. So I think making sure that um, also, deaf people understand that as well. And there are actually great um, resources. If you look at the National Association of Deaf, there's a, a subsection called Help, and there's a template letter that um, we are giving to that deaf people can download and then plug in their own information. Um, so we're doing, we've been approaching this, um, not necessarily clinic by clinic, but more at the student level who are, are becoming our future clinicians. Um, there's something in the chat. It's called Deaf Diabetes Can Together. So we're we're going to be um, launching here actually in March um, with our initial pilot study. Um, so if you Google this, you probably wouldn't find us quite yet, but um, we'll be launching here very shortly. Great question. No, I think we have time for another question. It looks like there's a question in the chat. Oh, uh, yes. So the question is, is there an issue in using American Sign Language materials with finding plain language explanations of medical concepts and terminology? How do you address this? So if, if I'm understanding, um, can you tell me whoever the, George, um, can you, Clarify, are you trying to compare it either or? Like if I give someone a handout in plain English language versus ASL, is that the question? I'm thinking things like, uh, do, do you have a problem in ASL with uh, materials using, for instance, hypertension versus high blood pressure or or other, other terms like that? Do, do you have trouble finding material that is going to be uh, suitable for someone who does not have medical background. You know, it's commonly said that uh, uh, most medical articles are written at the collegiate level when, when, when people, um, uh, I think the average reading level is like fifth grade, if I remember right, or something like some, somewhere around there. Uh, is that an issue in, in using ASL materials? Yeah, great question. So just like in English, we have high glucose or, or we have high blood sugar or glucose. There, it's the same in sign language. There's a sign for glucose and blood sugar. And so we've been using more of the layperson term. So in high blood pressure or blood pressure instead of um, hypertension, elevate, elevated cholesterol instead of hypercholesterolemia. And so 
um, yeah, we're using more of a lay language. Um, Murdoch, do you want to share the reading level for deaf individuals? Sure, yeah. <clears throat> I actually wrote uh, my dissertation on uh, learning disabilities for those that are deaf. Um, it's hard to discern the difference between low vocabulary from language deprivation as a result of not having language access growing up versus those that have uh, organic disabilities or neuro differences. So something that we have found that is very helpful, and obviously this is not, uh, you, you can't fix uh, learning disabilities or language deprivation. There's, there's no uh, repair for that. What we do use is a classifier system. So when we uh, share a term that is uh, perhaps a medical academic term, there's also uh, um, a level of expansion um, to clarify what that means. So it helps contextualize what that word could mean and how to how it's associated um, between, like for instance, uh, low blood sugar and a crash, right? So we would use classifiers to bridge that gap um, in understanding what that gap is. Um, not just, and this isn't the case for, for just deaf folks. I mean, this could be the, the, the case for folks that have low language function. Uh, I mean, we see this on uh, shows on TV. You start to see uh, sign language for babies um, because this helps language acquisition for babies who hear, just as it does for babies that are deaf. So I think the mainstream media is catching up to some of this uh, theory and understanding of the world. Uh, with deaf folks, there is a slight difference. We have to be sure that they understand what the meaning of each word is um, with the use of those classifiers. So, so a good example of uh, an expansion is the word carbohydrate. There's not really a replacement word for carbohydrate for a layperson. So you have to explain what it is. So a carbohydrate is a food that will raise your blood sugar. So examples, rice, potato, pasta, um, those types of things. So we have to give a lot of examples to expand on what that term is, especially when there's not a lay equivalent. Thank you. All right, well, I think that was perfect. <laughs> I, I really appreciate both of you being here. Uh, I really appreciate the ASL interpreter, Cody, is just fantastic. It's been my first time I've ever been this close to uh, being able to organize um, a, an interpreter, and, I, and it just adds value, I, so I really appreciate it. Um, so we really appreciate you sharing your, uh, your knowledge and your perspectives. Um, you know, we're really only, I think for me and perhaps other librarians, um, it's really only touching the surface and introducing them to the, to the subject. Um, so I think that's sort of a cue to an organization like the NNLM that there's clearly, clearly more work to be done. Um, I do hope that people on the call and then people who are watching the, the recording of this might get some sort of inspiration that they might um, consider uh, looking at the, the, the hard of hearing and deaf community and un better understand what their health information needs are. So that is just, just super fantastic. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. Um, I do want to put in the chat that if you uh, people here want to get uh, CE credit from the Medical Library Association, they can just click on that link um, and then it, all the instructions you need to uh, re re retrieve those credits are, is there. Um, I do want to remind people that uh, next March, I guess March 9th, 2023, at 11 o'clock Mountain, 1 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we are gonna be doing another R4 Connection session. Uh, the topic is still being worked on. And so uh, we hope to have, our plan is to get uh, what that topic is and who our speakers are out as soon as possible. Uh, so with that, I think, um, I hope everybody has a great rest of their day. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the Network of the National Library of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel, or select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.